Yeah, Kyle and Dion and Bree, yeah. Yeah, man, so good to see all of you guys. My goodness. All right, everybody, everybody, did you get a chance to put your offering in? All right, just want to make sure. All right. <laughs> all right, there you go. I forgot to mention this why I said that, and, and thank the Lord our children remember. They do. They come up and start, open up the, open it up and put it in there. We, yeah, yeah, take you, get your pastor out of hot water. Yeah, that's a guarantee you. Ah, goodness. All right, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be looking at something new today. Uh, we're starting a, a little short series about four messages. I think it'll be four messages, unless I have to break some of them up or something, but I mean, you know, I have to do that every now and then, uh, but, uh, but anyway, I plan four messages uh, out of the book of Daniel, out of the book of Daniel. I don't know how long it's been since you've read the book of Daniel, but Daniel is a tremendous prophet of the Old Testament, uh, one of the greatest prophetic books, actually, in my opinion, um, Daniel and Isaiah probably uh, give us more information about, uh, about Christ and the, and the timings of things concerning Christ. And the, and the kingdoms and, and, and those kind of things than, uh, than the other prophets do. And I just enjoy Daniel tremendously. It has 12 chapters, and we're not going to be looking at all 12 chapters. We're going to be just looking at six of them. So the first six chapters in the book of Daniel are about, um, about the, the Hebrew boys, uh, Daniel and his friends that have been taken, well, all of Israel actually, but they've been, they, they do some special things with the boys, but all of Israel's been taken captive by Babylon, and Israel is uh, in captivity. Uh, God allowed Israel to be taken into captivity, and we'll be looking at what was going on and why all of that happened, and they'll, they'll, be, in, um, they'll be in Babylon for 70 years. The last six chapters of the book of Daniel are about prophecy. They're about the kingdoms of the world. Much of the prophecy has been fulfilled and much of it is even being fulfilled right now as we speak uh, because the, uh, there are prophecies about the coming of Christ. There are prophecies about the kingdoms of the world. There are prophecies about the future kingdoms of the world that are in tribulation, but we're not gonna be studying prophecy. We're gonna be looking at the first six chapters. And so we find Israel in, ex in, in exile and um, God's allowed them to be taken and they've been there for 70 years under four different kings. These kings are pagan kings. They're all unique. They're, uh, um, they have attributes about them. The first one is Nebuchadnezzar and then Belshazzar, Darius the Mede, and then um, uh, Cyrus the Great is a, actually a Persian and he's gonna play a big part in the deliverance of Israel. It's really a tremendous miracle what God does to get them out and um, it was prophesied and it has a lot to do with what's going on nowadays. So it's just all in intertwined, and, and, and God put them into captivity for um, one reason, and that is God had made a commandment concerning the land, and he said, uh, in, this was in Exodus, Leviticus, and in Second Chronicles, all three places, God made a, a commandment concerning the land. Now, you know that God made 10 commandments concerning us, right? And one of those commandments was, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and it goes on to explain the Sabbath day. It says, six days you can do all of the work that you do, but on the seventh day you're to rest and, and not work at all. And, and so the Sabbath of the land was the commandment that God said, every seven years you are to let the land rest and not plant anything on the land and let the land completely rest and replenish itself and so forth. Well, for 490 years, for 490 years, Israel did not obey this commandment. Now, how many of you would agree that if you had gotten away with something for 490 years, you would pretty much think you were getting away with it, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd pretty much think, hey, God doesn't really mean this and he's forgotten about what he commanded because 490 years is a long time. But I'll just remind you that God, ne God never forgets. And, uh, and, 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 though, and though it may take some time, God always stays true to his word and what he commands us to do. And so, so for 70 years, that one year for every year that they stole from the land, 490 years, there are seven of those years, every seven years, let it rest, that's 70 years. And he kept them in captivity for 70 years. And so anyway, they, um, they, they thought, 
thought they were getting away with it, but God uh, called them to uh, account for it. Now, you would think that because they spend 70 years in Babylon, and I want to share this with you because I think uh, uh, many times we as God's children have a misconception about this. You, th you would think that because they spend 70 years in captivity, which means that they're basically enslaved, they're basically under the, the dominion of the Babylonian kingdom, and, and, and they're harsh, they're, they're mistreated, they're abused, some of them are even killed. I mean, this is the kind of thing that happens in, in captivity. And you would think that God was doing this in order to punish them. But here's the point I want you to, to, to grasp now. And the same thing is true for us because we're God's children, right? All right, God does not, God does not punish his children. Now, I know some of you are going, yeah, you're right about that, Pastor. And then some are going, well, I don't know. What, what? He, he, he seems to punish me. You know? No, God doesn't punish his children. And the reason why he doesn't punish his children is because he's already punished his son on the cross. What does Isaiah tell us about Jesus? When Isaiah's talking about Jesus, he said, this is Isaiah 53, he says, surely he has borne our sorrows and he has carried our grief. Yeah. And yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, yeah. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we're healed. So God doesn't punish his children because he's already punished Jesus on the cross for the sins of his children. What God does to his children is God disciplines his children. God corrects his children. Like a, like a loving parent, God disciplines his children. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know many of us, in, maybe even in here today, weren't disciplined by a loving parent, so you really aren't sure what loving discipline is really all about. But loving discipline is the kind of discipline that you get from a parent that cares what happens in yeah, your life yeah. and wants you to make wise choices and protect you from things that are going to harm you. And so even though the discipline might involve uh, even spanking, you know, something physical, uh, the intention is not to harm you and not to make pain for you, but to encourage you not to make those bad decisions that you've made or do those things that, that you've done that are, gonna, that are gonna really harm you in life. And when you're disciplined by a loving parent, it, after you're disciplined, and it's a strange psychology, and some of you might even feel the same thing. I, I thought about it some and I said, how does that happen that you can be disciplined, you can be, you can be spanked? I, of course, I grew up being spanked. Yeah. How many of you grew up being spanked? Oh, yeah. uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, you know, when you spank a child, and this is, just one little, this is just one little tip now, and I don't want this to sound cruel or anything, but when you spank a child, you have to spank them enough to break their will. Uh -huh. You can't just spank them enough to make them mad. I mean, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to get mad. I mean, you're getting, you're getting a spanking. The first thing's going through your mind is you just get extremely mad. But you keep on getting spanked a little bit more, and it'll go past being mad, and your will will get broken. <laughs> and, it'll be, and, when you, and when you finally dry up from it, there will be a strange drawing to, to your parent who loves you. I mean, it's a weird psychology, but, but it happens that way. And you'll, and, and you'll understand uh, uh, they did this because they love me. And, uh, and bless the Lord, I needed it. Uh, I mean, I, I needed to, to be adjusted in life because what I was doing was gonna harm my life. It was gonna make, it was gonna make life miserable for me or for my children or my grandchildren, whatever, whatever it might be. So this is what God does to his children. God does not punish his children. God disciplines his children. God corrects his children. And this is what God is doing to Israel while they're in Babylonian captivity. God is disciplining them for their own good. Horticultural scientists nowadays tell us that, it, that, that, that uh, the land needs to be replenished. That's right, that's right. And if you don't replenish the land, the land will go flat 
and it won't grow anything. Now, I'll just remind you that, you know, we're in a day now where we have all kind of fertilizers and we have all kind of additives and we can do things to the land now that they couldn't do back then. They didn't have the privilege of doing that kind of stuff back then. And here's what would have happened. If you can't grow anything, guess what happens to all of you and your descendants? And <laughs> they all die, right? Yeah, you can't grow anything, you die. That's, that was the rule. They didn't have a grocery store to go to and be able to go down here and, and truck something in and all of that. They had to have land that were produced. And so God said, look, here, you're killing the land. The reason I gave you that command is because I wanted you to be blessed. I wanted you to be able to eat for the rest of your life and your children and your grandchildren and the land to be beautiful. See, Israel right now could be a flat desert <laughs> if, if, if God hadn't commanded them to take care of the land. So God was giving them, God was correcting them for their own good. He was adjusting them for their, for, so, that, so that their life would be better. But here's the rub. Here's what, here's what the message is about, actually. Here's, here's the rub of that whole thing. When God is disciplining you and God is correcting you for your own good, during the same time God is correcting you and disciplining you, Satan is attacking you. And he's attacking you in order to place things in you while you're being disciplined by God that when the discipline is over, you're going to take bad things away from that. Uh, uh, thoughts, um, concepts, um, uh, beliefs about God. God you know, God's, God's correcting me because he wants my life to be better. And the devil's saying, uh, uh, God hates you. God's not there. God's not listening to you. God doesn't know what's going on to you. Man, there is no God. God. God's up in heaven somewhere and he doesn't care what's happening. He doesn't know what's going on. I mean, he they, they puts all kinds of things and he's always trying to attack. So in this series, God is adjusting Israel just as God does us. And there are four kings that are, that are mentioned in Daniel, four kings in Babylon that are being used by the enemy to try to place something into God's people while God's people are being disciplined, the four kings are, try, are being used by Satan to put something into God's people so that when God finally delivers them, which he will, because the discipline will be over at some point, right? That when they leave Babylon, that part of Babylon would go with them. In other words, while God was doing something good for Israel, Satan was trying to put something in them that would go with them for the rest of their life and that they'd never get over. And so there's one character that transcends all four kings, one leader that God put there. And of course, I'm talking about Daniel. Daniel was a teenager when he was taken into captivity, along with some friends of his that you've heard about before, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, they were all taken along with other teenagers from the land of Israel. And they were put in a special school so that these kings could teach them the ways of the Babylonians and, uh, and, and, could, and could place something in them that, uh, that, that would last and endure forever and be a harm to their life. Now, there's always one thing true about God. Even when God is disciplining you, God is still protecting you and God is still providing for you. Though he might be, you know, uh, the, the, I mean, he might be punishing or, or not, uh, there I go using the word, he might be disciplining you. Um, he's still watching after you. He's still taking care of you because he wants you to be well and whole. And even though Israel was in captivity physically, God didn't want them to be taken into captivity spiritually. So God was protecting them the whole time they were there. And you'll see it in these scriptures because we're about to start reading some scripture. And you'll see God is protecting them the whole time. God is providing for them the whole time that they're there. But the enemy is really trying to do a number on, on God's people like he does with us. And so the first king we'll meet today is Nebuchadnezzar. He's the first king that Daniel ran into. And Nebuchadnezzar shows us how, how dangerous pride is in our life. And I know I've, I've talked a lot about pride in the last 
uh, probably what, four or five months, it seems like I've, I'm almost always talking about pride in some way. And I just want you to understand that the reason I, I think pride is such an issue in God's word, and there are so many examples that God shows us about the dangers of pride, is because pride is such a, a subtle thing in our life. It, 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 it's insidious. It, it just it, it hides itself inside of us, and and we can and, and we can go all of our life full of pride and never know that that pride is dominating our life. And pride locks us into certain things. And pride keeps us involved in certain things. And it won't let us clear our life and clean our life. And, and remember, God also fights against pride in our life. That's something you might need to know. And so Nebuchadnezzar is a king that is just filled with pride. You'll also remember that it was pride that caused Lucifer to fall from heaven, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, that was the original sin. That was the first sin. That's what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. And then I'll just remind you that the first way that he tempted Adam and Eve was with pride, right? He said to Eve, uh, did God say you can't eat of all these trees in the garden? And she said, well, uh, uh, we can eat of all of these. We just can't eat of those, th those in the middle right there. And, 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 and he said, well, what did God tell you? And she said, well, God said, we can't eat them. If we eat them, we'll die. And Adam added, you can't even touch them. But anyway, um, she, and, and Satan said to her, what did he say to her? You won't die. Now listen to the pride here. God knows that if you eat of this, you will be like him. Just imagine that. You could be like God. You could be worshiped. You could be the big man. You could make the rules. You could be like God. And that's the only reason God doesn't want you to eat of them because he, won't, he doesn't want you to be like him. And then you remember when, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus, the same kind of thing. He tried to use pride to do it. What was the first thing Satan said to him? Command these stones be made bread, right? It, but but he, said, he said a little phrase before he said command these stones be made bread. Here's what he said. Hear the pride. If you are the son of God, if you're the son of God. Come on, Jesus. If you're, son, if you're God's son, uh, perform something for me. Do, do me something, you know, so I can, so I can brag on you and, and you can, I can recognize you as the son of God. So in, in other words, he tried to use pride even to tempt Jesus to fall. Well, pride is one of the first attacks that Satan uses against God's people. So what I want to share with you are three ways to resist uh, to resist pride, all right? First way, let me give them to you quick. Give God the glory. All right, all right, give God the glory. You will allow pride a foothold or a stronghold in your life mm -hmm. by not giving God the glory. Yeah. Let me show you Daniel chapter one. First verse, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought, art, brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. All right, who gave Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar? The Lord did. God says, look, I am giving you this victory. I am allowing this to happen. Why was God allowing it to happen? Because God was discipline, disciplining his children. And they wouldn't let the land rest, and he was going to hold them for every year they didn't let the, 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 the land rest. But the point I want you to see is it was the Lord that did this. But Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't recognize that. Nebuchadnezzar took all the credit for it, and he wouldn't give God any of the glory for any of that victory to take Israel into captivity because Nebuchadnezzar was full of pride. Yeah. And, 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 and let me give you a simple definition of pride, all right? You say, well, okay, is my life filled with pride? Well, here, here's a simple definition of pride. Pride is not giving God glory for everything you have in your hand. Everything you have in your hand, God gave you, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. He gave you the strength. Yeah. He gave you the mind. He gave you the ability. He gave you the talent. 
He even put some of the items. Everything that you have in your hand, God put it in your hand. But when you begin to think that your intellect did it or your ability did it or your cleverness did it or your training or your skill, you are completely ignoring the fact that God gave you every God, God gave you the ability to learn. God gave you the intelligence you have, the IQ. You didn't choose that. You didn't even choose where you were born. You didn't choose what family you were born into. You didn't even choose what country you were born into. You didn't choose the environment that you lived in. You didn't choose the opportunities and the, and, and the advancements that you might have in life. So everything that we have comes from God. And so recognizing this is giving God glory. That God is the, God gave me everything I have and, 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 and all glory belongs to God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did not give God glory. So enter now Daniel and his three friends. Daniel is uh, his Hebrew name, by the way. You'll see the Babylonians give Daniel another name. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we always call them, that's, that is their Babylonian names. And you'll see them. But anyway, so these four enter into the, in, into the issue. And, 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 and remember, of course, Satan through Nebuchadnezzar is trying to put pride into the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And they're going to have many opportunities under Nebuchadnezzar to, to, to be proud of themselves and to take some pride in life, and he's going to encourage that. Verse 3, Daniel 1. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young, listen to the description of them. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick understanding. Hey, sounds like my resume. Who had ability. Uh, Y'all know I'm kidding, right? <laughs> Uh, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. I just want to call attention to the fact that the first thing that they try to do to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and all the other intelligent, loyal, good-looking, handsome, uh, capable young men of Israel is they tried to teach them a new literature and a new language. Satan always wants to do that. Now, I, I, I don't want to make a, 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 mount, a mo, mountain out of a molehill, but listen, God, the first thing the enemy does when he wants to, to change you is he tries to rewrite history. He tries, to, he tries to lead you away from the things that you have been taught and the things that, 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 are, that, are, that, that your parents and, 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 and your country and has put deep inside of you. And so nowadays, I mean, even nowadays, you can look and see that language, a lot of the words that we use in our language nowadays don't mean what they used to mean, right? And some of them, rap music, are unintelligible, right? Yeah, you can't even discern what they're even, what they're even saying. And, and, and it's an attempt of the enemy. Listen, it's an attempt of the enemy to take us away from our heritage and, 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 and for us to forget that this country was formed in order that we might have freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. And so uh, here's Nebuchadnezzar. He's trying to teach them new things, you know, and new literature, new, all of that kind of stuff to take them away from all of their culture, all of their past, everything that God had previously put into them. And so enter now uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, I had a, when I was a young preacher, it's funny how you remember things. When I was a young preacher, I had a, I had a young preacher friend. He thought it was funny. Every time you mentioned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he would say, my shack, yo shack, and a bungalow. <laughs> It's funny how you remember crazy stuff like that. But anyway, um, in chapter one, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And in this dream, um, he, he, he wakes up and, and he calls all the wise men in and the astrologers and the soothsayers and the magicians and so forth. And he says, all right, guys, I had a dream last night and it's really, oh my goodness, I don't even know what it's about. But I want, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then I want you to tell me the interpretation of what I dreamed. And so, the, of course, the wise men, who say astrologers, magicians, like that, said, well, well King, that, that's impossible for us to, we, we, how could we do that? You're asking something, that's unreasonable. Nobody could ever do that. And the king said, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to kill you. 
And they said, well, I, I'm sorry, we still can't do it. I mean, my, my goodness. And so the king said, all right, well, all the wise men, soothsayers, astrologers, magicians, they, get, they gotta die. Everybody in the whole kingdom. And that includes Daniel and his young friends that have been brought in to be the wise men of, of Israel, of, of, of Babylon. And so they go to get Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and all the other good looking young men. And, and Daniel says, hey, what's going on? And, and the, the, the messenger says, well, the king had a dream and he and told the wise man to tell him what he dreamed and tell him the interpretation of the dream. And none of them can do it, so all of y'all gotta die. And Daniel said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, let, let me talk to the king. So Daniel chapter two, verse 26 Daniel goes to the king. Then the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, that was his, yeah. that was his Babylonian name. Are, Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but look at this line, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed, sounds like Dr. Seuss, right? <laughs> your dream and your visions of your head upon your bed were these. Now, before we get to what it was, and I'm going to tell you what it was. I know you're sitting there going, what was it? What was it? Well, it, the message is not about it, but I am going to tell you what it was. But what I want you to notice here first is that Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar that he cannot tell him what he dreamed or the interpretation of what he dreamed, but God can work through him to reveal it to Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel is not saying, hey, I can do it, king. God's given me special abilities, special gifts, and I can just do anything. I, what is it you want to know? He didn't, that, that's not his attitude. His attitude was, I can't, they can't do it, and I can't do it, but God can do it, and God can use me, God can work with me, and work through me to reveal it to you. Now, I think this is a good point to talk for just a second about false humility. Mm -hmm. There was a saying that went around the body of Christ when I was young, and I, I was back in that 70s, <laughs> 70s, 80s, you know. When I was young, when I was a young preacher, there was a saying that just meant almost everybody in the whole body of Christ was saying this, this statement. At, you know, every time somebody complimented them, here, here was the statement. It was all God. It was all God. Now, that is a statement of false humility. Because Let me, let me just give, show what I'm talking about. Steve Green. How many of you have ever heard of Steve Green, the singer? Steve Green. Nobody? Oh, praise the Lord. Well, anyway, just believe me then when I say Steve Green... Was he sang at Billy Graham Crusades back then? He sang in the vo uh, uh, Gaither Vocal Band. Man, he was a tremendous singer, great singer. One of his friends said that at a concert that, uh, that he had, that somebody after the concert came up to him and 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 said to him, "Brother, that was really good tonight." And Steve Green said, "It was all God." And the guy said, "It wasn't that good." Because uh, if it was all God, it would have been really great. But what I'm saying to you is that, that nothing, is, nothing that happens through us is all God. It, 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 I do a lot, I mean, God inspires me, and please don't take what I'm saying wrong. I'm not trying to cut God out of anything. I'm just, well, I want to tell you the truth about things. And, 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 we need to, and we need to fight this. This is so easy to fall into, this false humility thing. And we can think we're humble, but we're really not humble. We're really falsely humble. God gives me ideas. God speaks to me about directions for messages. God, God uh, uh, increases my curiosity about some things. When I'm reading the Bible, I get excited about some things, and I, and I sense that that's God leading me you know, to be involved in that. And, and God does all kinds. He gives me the strength to study, and, and, and he inspires me, and he does all of these kind of things. But I'm going to tell you, I have to do a lot of hard work. 
in preparing messages and everything to present to you and outlines and PowerPoints and, and all of the things. I mean, that's a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. So God expects me to do a lot of work. In other words, God inspires me. God directs me. God does all kinds of things to bless me and to lead me through. But, but uh, it's not all God because God expects me to do my part in it and I have to do, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, it's not magic that puts those pa words on those papers or puts the words on that screen or, or, or figures out how you're gonna talk about certain things. That takes study and hard work and God expects me to do my part. So it, it, some people after church and have, are so nice to me a lot of times. They'll come up and say, Pastor, that was such a great word, you know, and, and compliment me. And, and if I look at them and I say, it's all God, that's false humility because it's not all God. God expects me to do my part in it. You know what the proper response to that when somebody compliments you, you know what the proper response is? Thank you. Thank you. Not some falsely humble statement like, it's all God. You know? Well, anyway, what I'm saying is that one of the ways to fight pride in your life is to give God the glory that he deserves for the things that he has given you and does in your life. That will help you resist pride. Second thing, reject the glory of men. I know that sounds really elementary, but this happens all the time. Yes, it's right. It's right to give honor where honor is due. I mean, that's not a bad thing. But listen, God is the only one who deserves the glory for things. We deserve to be honored if we do honorable things, but we don't deserve the glory that only belongs to God. Well, here was what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a giant statue. This statue looked like a man. It had a head of gold, which Daniel told him was the Babylonian kingdom, which Nebuchadnezzar represented. He said, you're the head of gold. And then, and then as you went down the body, the body had chest and arms of silver, which Daniel said, that'll be the kingdom that comes after you. That's the Medes and the Persians. They're gonna take you over and then they're gonna rule. And then as you went down the body, its belly and its thighs are bronze which will be the third kingdom that will rule over the world. And this is the Greek kingdom. Alexander the Great conquered the world. That's the Greek empire. And then he said, its legs are gonna be of iron, which, are, which is the Roman empire. And these are the four empires that, that, that would rule the world is what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. And then he said, and those feet, those feet that you see that are clay, mixed with iron, got 10 toes, and some of them are clay, some of them are iron, feet, feet are of, of clay and, and iron. That's a future kingdom that's gonna come one day, and he's talking about during the tribulation when the revived Roman Empire that rules the world will come, and, and that's a whole prophecy thing, but that was, that was what the dream was, and that was the interpretation of the dream. So chapter two ends with Nebuchadnezzar making this tremendous pronouncement about Daniel's God. Nebuchadnezzar just falls down and starts exclaiming, that's the greatest God in all the world. There's no God like Daniel's God. That God has to be worshiped. Anybody that doesn't worship Daniel's God, I'm gonna put him, you know, I'm gonna kill him. I mean, he, nobody can be worshiped except Daniel's God. I mean, he just goes wild praising and acknowledging Daniel's God. That's the end of chapter two. Chapter three, verse one. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. Now, let me just stop right there for a second. A cubit is about 18 inches. So this statue was approximately nine feet wide at the base and 90 feet tall. As you can tell, all of you geometric people, that's a 10 to one ratio. There's another monument that's built with a 10 to one ratio. The Washington Monument is built with a 10 to one ratio. Of course, it's much bigger. It's, fi it's 55 feet wide at the bottom and it's 550 feet tall. So I've heard a lot of people try to uh, speculate on what this statue was. And they said, the Bible didn't tell us what the statue was. It just said he made a statue of gold. Well, what was the statue, what, what, what was it? Was it a man? 
or was it Nebuchadnezzar? And all I'm just trying to say by this uh, geometry lesson is, if it was Neb- if, if Nebuchadnezzar built a statue to himself and it was, and it was uh, six, nine feet wide <laughs> at the bottom and 90 feet tall, that means Neb- Neb- Nebuchadnezzar was a tall, skinny dude. I mean, he was big. I mean, it would have been proportionately like, you know, really weird looking. So it probably wasn't a statue of himself, but the commandment was, Nebuchadnezzar built the statue and when you heard the music play, the Babylonian Bee Gees were gonna start playing, or Beastie Boys, uh, Babylonian Beastie Boys, or whoever it's hot now, uh, Babylonian Bieber, uh, or whatever, whoever it is that's the hottest young thing. When Nebuchadnezzar said, all right, when you hear that music start playing, you gotta fall down and, and, and worship that statue that I put on that plane out there. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of the crowd. And the music started playing and they didn't bow down. And somebody ratted them out. And said, they didn't bow. And so King Nebuchadnezzar calls them in. And he says, hey guys, man, I, I, you know, I, I like you. Uh, you, you. You're great young men. Uh, but you, you, didn't, you, you didn't bow down when you heard the music? And they said, no, we, we didn't. And they, he said, well, I'm gonna give you another chance. And they said, King, we don't need another chance because we're not gonna bow down no matter what. The only one we bow down to is our God. And he said, well, you know, I hate to do this to you, but I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to punish you, you know? It's gonna be severe. And the thing I want you to notice, though, is how quickly, notice how quickly Right at the end of chapter two, he has just fallen out, giving glory to God and making proclamations about God and God's the greatest and God's wonderful. And then in the very first verse of chapter three, here he is again, wanting to be worshiped himself. This is how subtle and insidious pride is. You know, this is not really uncommon in the scripture though. It's not uncommon for men to, be, men to want to worship other men in the scripture. You remember Paul and Barnabas, they were in the city of Lystra. This is like Acts 14 or so. And there was a man there that couldn't walk and they healed the man on the street. He couldn't walk. And the people on the street looked at them and said, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. These guys, hey, guys, the gods have come down and they're walking among us down here. And then they started trying to give Paul and Barnabas Greek god names, you know, like Apollo and Zeus and whatever all the other ones are. And, 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 and Paul and, and Barnabas had to rip, it said, by the script said they ripped their clothes and they said, no, you can't worship us. We're not gods. You, God, worship only belongs to God. And then, and then uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 22, John is being led around heaven by an angel. Some of you might remember this. Being led, led around heaven by an angel and, and he's seeing all kinds of sights and he gets so beside himself when he sees all these sights that he falls at the foot of the angel and begins to worship the angel and praise the angel and glorify the angel and the angel has to stop him and say, no, no, man, no, no, don't worship me. Worship only belongs to God. You can't be worshiping me. So men are always wanting to worship other men and, and, and give credit to, to other people for God's work alone. And pride is such a subtle monster that you just really have to resist it. And so Satan is always giving Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the opportunity to develop and exhibit some pride. And so King Nebuchadnezzar made this command and, and they didn't bow. And, and verse 15 of Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar says this, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And now notice the pride. And who is this God who will deliver you from my hands? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's a self-made man, right? I mean, he thinks he made himself in my hands. Who do you think is powerful enough to take you from my hands? So see, Nebuchadnezzar is not recognizing God at all. He's giving no glory to God. He's just receiving the glory of men. And what I'm saying is one of the ways we have to resist pride is by not falling into the trap of receiving the glory of men. Nebuchadnezzar falls right in and just participates right on along. Look at verse 19, Daniel 3, 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury 
and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and he commanded that, the, that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Now let me just give you a little brief description of the furnace. The furnace of Babylon was a 20 foot diameter, 20 foot deep hole in the ground. That was the furnace. On one side, it had some steps that were carved out of the clay that led up out of the, out of the furnace so that, that occasionally some workers could go down in there and, and clean out things or do some things like that and they could get in and out of the furnace. That's how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the furnace, up those, up those stairs. But that was the furnace, a 20 by 20 hole in the ground and, they, and when somebody would, re, would resist the king, uh, they would just take them over there and, and throw them in the hole and the hole was burning with fire. And, and, and it says this time that it was heated, it was seven times hotter than it had ever been. And the way they got it seven times hotter is they had some special wood. You know, we have, there are certain woods that burn hotter than other woods, right? I mean, like mesquite burns real hot, and there are a lot of other types of trees and wood that burn real, real uh, hot. Well, Babylon had wood like that, and they saved it for special occasions, and this was one of those special occasions. This was going to be a real big deal. So they heated it up seven times hotter. Then these men, verse 21, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, that fire was so hot, even the people that threw them in the furnace died. God, God just wanted you to know it wasn't an accident that they made it through this burning, fiery furnace. And so, and, and, and now in verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He looks down there and, 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 and he rose in haste and he, and he spoke saying to his counselors, uh, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. Uh, look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. A couple of, com of comforting observations about this. Number one, when you go into the furnace of torture for God, the only thing that is going to be burned off of you are the things that bind you. They went in with their turbans, their hats, their belts, their coat, bound, cast into the furnace. And what, when Nebuchadnezzar looked in it, what does it say? I see them loose, walking around in there. In other words, the only thing that got burned on them were the things that had them bound. Now, if you can apply that to your spiritual life, that's what I'm talking about. God will allow the fiery furnace to burn off the things that bind you. And... Who did they find fellowship with when they went into the furnace? Jesus was in there walking around with them. So when you go into the fiery furnace, for God's sake, Jesus is going to be in the furnace with you. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So to have fellowship with the force, you have to face the furnace, right? Okay, all right, try that two or three times. All right, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar is impressed by this. One of the things I keep noticing about Nebuchadnezzar is how God keeps trying to get through to him. Do you notice this? Nebuchadnezzar's a pagan king. Nebuchadnezzar is a Babylonian. He's not even a Jew. He's not one of God's chosen children. And yet God somehow just keeps on trying to give him another chance and get through to him with amazing things. And you know what amazes me? People can see amazing things like this and then turn away from God. Does that, does that amaze you? If I saw all of that, I'm thinking, man, there ain't no way I wouldn't believe God. I mean, good night. Boy, all those miracles, who could see all those miracles and then turn away from God? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But Nebuchadnezzar's done it, done it twice so far. You know, he makes a decree that Daniel's God is the greatest God in all the world. 
And now he makes a decree that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the greatest God in all the world. Of course, it's the same God. He doesn't. He doesn't he's not aware of that. But it's the same God. And he says, all right, everybody's got to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And man, you can't worship any other God. He, does, he says a lot of the same things he said about Daniel's God, and he just gets beside himself. And, 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 and so now he's done it twice. So the third thing that will keep you from pride is practice speaking humbly. Give glory to God. Refuse the glory of men. And practice speaking humbly. Now you have to practice it because it doesn't come natural. And the enemy is always trying to increase pride in your life. Let me show you. 12 months later now, 12 months later, Daniel gave him the dream. He's the greatest God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fiery furnace. He's the greatest God. Twice he's been, he's been uh, uh, shown how wonderful and God is, and he's made these tremendous statements, and he's, he's, he's recognized the greatness of God. And now, 12 months later, here's Nebuchadnezzar, right back in full pride mode again. Daniel chapter 4, verse 29. At the end of 12 months... He was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling in my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Notice the prideful words. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is, I mean, God, it's like God said, I told you not to do that. I, 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 I've tried twice now to impress you and get this pride out of you that you've got it that's just ruling your life and ruining your life. And I told you not to do that. And so God speaks from heaven now and he says, uh, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall, listen to what's, what's going to happen to him. Now, I meant to say a while ago, God does not punish his children, but he does punish the evil. The book of Psalms, many places tell you that. Isaiah tells you that. God punishes evil people now. They're not his children. He doesn't punish his children. He disciplines his children. But he punishes the evil. And Nebuchadnezzar is not one of his. All right, so look what's going to happen to him. Um, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you. In other words, this is going to go on for seven years. Woo! Until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. Why am I saying that it is so important to speak humbly? It's because of what Matthew 12, 34 says. Do you know what Matthew 12, 34 says? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, I've taught this verse all of my life, and I've taught it as a literalist. In other words, I've taught what this verse is saying is whatever comes out of your mouth is in your heart, is a reflection of what's in your heart. And that's literally what the verse means. But I want to add just, uh, I, was, I was studying this the other day, and I declare if I, didn't, if, if I didn't sense God saying this to me, I don't know, and I'm going to say it to you, and I hope that's right, all right? All right, Lord, it had to be you. It couldn't yeah. be anybody else, but... Yeah. But let me just tell you what dawn, you know, you know wisdom, I mean, not wisdom, uh, truth comes from God, right? Mm -hmm. God reveals truth. Yes. You don't discover truth. God reveals truth. Yes. When God gets ready for you to have a certain truth, he reveals it to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you've had this happen to you. I know you've been reading verses before and all of a sudden yeah. it, it, a whole new light would kind of come in like, good night, man. I didn't, why have I never noticed that? I've read that verse 50 times, never noticed that. Well, this was like that with this verse, out of the abundance of the heart. I'm saying, listen, I'm saying we need to practice speaking humbly for a reason. And here's the reason. All right, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
I've always just taught simply that if you said it, you meant it because it came out of your heart. You wouldn't, if it wasn't in your heart, you wouldn't have said it. And I know you've probably had arguments with people and they've said bad stuff and they've hurt your feelings and all that kind of stuff. And you, because you said, uh, if you didn't think that way, if that wasn't in your heart, uh, you wouldn't have said it. So, hey, there you go. Uh, you just have to forgive. That's where forgiveness comes in, right? Okay, you can't unsay stuff, right? So be careful how you talk. But listen, all right, here's, here's what the Lord had me see in this, in this verse. I, uh, my, my, my focus went immediately on the word abundance. Out of the abundance. And what, and, and, and what dawned on me at that moment was that what this verse is literally saying is, and let me, let me read it to you with the right emphasis, and then I think you'll understand what I'm saying. Out of the abundance yeah. of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, mm -hmm. my mouth speaks. In other words, the light I saw on this was whatever is abundant in my heart, mm -hmm. that's what I talk about. Mm -hmm. So if pride is what's in my, it, look, let me, let me work it backwards. If prideful statements are coming out of my mouth, mm -hmm. it means that my heart is abundantly full of pride. Mm -hmm. That's what's taken up the room of my heart. Yeah, yeah. And so why do I practice speaking humbly? Because I want humility to, yeah. to be the abundance of my heart, mm -hmm. not pride. Mm -hmm. And you might need to know this. You might need to know this. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says that God fights against pride. In the book of James, right, chapter four, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, right? You know, and I've told you what resist means. Resist is a military word. Resist means God sends a battalion against pride. You, you're not gonna win. You, God, uh, it, it, God's gonna send overwhelming force to make sure you don't succeed because mm -hmm. you're full of pride because God can't stand pride. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it, in the book of Proverbs, it says, it, it, I don't know why I hadn't thought of this verse <laughs> up until now, but it says, uh, these six things God hates. Mm -hmm. Yes, and seven are an abomination. Mm -hmm. And the first one on the list is what? A proud look. God fights it. I don't want God fighting against me. I don't know about you. Look, the apostle Paul identified the good fight. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished my course. Therefore, it's laid up for rewards in heaven. You know what the good fight is? The good fight's with the devil because you can whip him. The bad fight's with God because you ain't gonna whip God now, I'm gonna tell you. And God fights and wars against. And you know, and do you know the way God usually fights against pride in your life? Humiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not nice, is it? You don't really like to be humiliated, do you? Well, then you need to know this. Practice speaking humbly. Because look at what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. All right, I'm, I love the way the story ends. Look at the way the story ends. Verse 34, Daniel 4. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. Immediately, immediately when Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his eyes to heaven, he, it, things started returning to him. Mm -hmm. All right? And, 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 and I blessed the most high God and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Mm -hmm. He got a pretty good revelation of that, didn't he? <laughs> At the same time, my reason returned to me 
And for the glory of my kingdom, he's just saying, God gave me a responsibility to be a king over a kingdom and he he restored it to me. That's that's what he's basically saying there. My honor and my splendor, splendor returned to me and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Mm. The seduction of pride. Yeah. Pride seduces you. It's subtle. It's terrible. It's insidious in our life. It locks sin in our heart. Yeah. It keeps us from repenting. It keeps us from forgiving. It locks all kinds of terrible things inside of us. That's why the enemy is so uh, adept at introducing pride into our life and convincing us that it's nothing wrong with a little pride. God changed that prideful man. God changed this prideful man. And God will change you. If you'll let him, you can resist this. And we have to resist because this is not God's will for our life. God's will for our life is that we would humbly walk, acknowledging God and everything in our life, and God would work through us to establish his kingdom on this earth. And by doing so, we would become so attractive to other people that they would want to follow the God that we follow. 